three, two, one. Okay, we're here in New Hope West in Eugene, Oregon with Pastor Wayne Cadero. He's the founder of the New Hope Movement and he uh, used to be in Hawaii and now he's in freezing Eugene, Oregon. I don't know why he's over here, but obviously God's uh, got a plan. <laughs> yeah, you can ask me about that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I haven't seen Pastor Wayne for a few years now, except for online. We've been doing Zoom meetings with some of the New Hope pastors, so it's good to see him in the flesh. Uh, Pastor Wayne, firstly, uh, we're here celebrating Christmas. Yep. Uh, tell us a bit about what New Hope West is doing for Christmas. Well, we've got a huge uh, extravaganza of lights. We call it Christmas on the Hill mm -hmm. because we're actually located on a hill here. And it's New Hope Church and College because we have a college here, mm -hmm. Leadership College, as well as the church. Mm -hmm. and so this is one of the few Christmases where it's really Christmassy. It's very cold. Usually in Hawaii, it's green and warm. <laughs> Some people ask me, Matt, they say, why did you go from Hawaii to Oregon? I said, yeah, it's sort of like going from paradise to purgatory. <laughs> but, <laughs> but wherever God calls us, we're glad to go. And the church is doing really well. Yeah. Well, I remember catching up with you here probably 10 years ago now. And... I found out that this was your alma mater. This is where you graduated That's from. That's right. Um, let's go back to the beginning and hear a bit of your testimony. My wife and I were just listening to one of your sermons where you shared how, as a 19-year-old, you were a rock and roller in Portland, <laughs> Oregon, yeah. before you came to Christ. Tell uh -huh. us a bit of your testimony. Well, I actually uh, got kicked out of my first high school and then uh, dropped out of my second to play music up in Portland. And... Uh, uh, there, my hair was long. It was during the Jesus movement of the late 60s and early 70s. And uh, there, up in Portland, I received Christ. And so three, I got so saved that three months after I received Christ, I went into Bible college. <laughs> and I, all I had was a paperback New Testament. Yeah. My hair was long. They made me cut it. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, very traumatic yeah. indeed. But uh, I'm glad I did, and we're here and have been here ever since. Yeah, wonderful. And, you know, I've been so impacted by your teaching over the years. Uh, you've got such an evangelistic heart. And, you know, the New Hope Movement has planted churches all around the world now. It's incredible. Tell us a bit about the birth of New Hope in Hawaii. Well, that started way back in 1984. And uh, that's our hometown where I'm from, Honolulu. And so we left here, I was here in ministry for 10 years as a youth pastor. And then we headed over to Hawaii to plant churches. So the first one was in a little place, a very cozy town out of the way called Hilo. Hilo is on the southernmost island of the chain of islands mm -hmm. and on the east side. Very wonderful place, beautiful people. There we began when I was 31 years old. Mm -hmm. There you go. And, and New Hope's also very well known for its creativity. And uh, I'm often coveting because I see that you guys have bands like Casting Crowns and Third Day and the Katinas <laughs> and like all these amazing Christian artists. You, know. uh, you also do a lot of hula. Tell us a bit about why you think creativity is important uh, in reaching the world with the gospel. Well, to us, uh, it's uh, redeeming the arts. In fact, you might hear over the microphone a little bit of the practicing going on because mm -hmm. the musicians actually are getting ready for our Christmas Eve services. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have wonderful students that love the arts. And so I tell people, Matt, uh, don't be afraid of technology. Redeem technology for the gospel. Don't be afraid of music. Redeem it yeah. for the gospel. Whatever there is, don't shy away from it. Go after it and redeem it for the gospel. Mm -hmm. And because I love music, and music sort of takes a message and goes around the head mm -hmm. and straight to the heart, I think uh, that would be something that God could use mm -hmm. if we would redeem it for the gospel, and he has. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I've loved all the music that New Hope Oahu, they've released albums and had all sorts of uh, in incredible songs go viral over the years. I've been watching that online. And, you know, of course, since COVID, uh, you know, a lot of churches are doing Facebook Live now. Uh, we were kind of forced into doing it, and, yeah. and now it's reaching the world. Yeah. Tell us a bit about how the online ministry has developed uh, here at New Hope West. Well, that's been something quite foreign to me, I have to mm. admit, Matt, because even though we do a lot of video, my heart is face-to-face. -face. Mm. I, I believe that discipleship happens life on life. Mm. 
and we'll use and redeem technology, but my first is life on life. Mm. So uh, as COVID hit, we knew we had to increase that portion of our ministry. Mm. And so we'd have to learn a lot of the new new ways of doing things, buy equipment, mm. very expensive, mm. and uh, put it online. But we know that God by his Holy Spirit is going to use it because mm. We're doing the best we can to promote uh, Jesus and to share the gospel. Mm. So mm. when anyone does that, the Holy Spirit jumps in and helps. Mm. Amen, amen. Now, when I first became a New Hope pastor 17 years ago, when I had hair, a long time ago, <laughs> uh, Pastor Phil McCallum, our mutual sure. friend, handed over the church to me. And he said, you've got to journal every day. You've got to do your daily devotions. Yep. And I was like, I'm a Pentecostal. I can, I, can, <laughs> I can read the Bible however I want. And he goes, no, this is the way we do it. I went, okay. And it was the best decision I ever made. 17 years now, reading through the scriptures every year has changed my life. And for you, I think it's been one of the gifts you've given to the body of Christ. You've just challenged wherever you go. Whenever I hear you speak around the world, you're challenging people to be in the word every day, uh, doing soap devotions, scripture, observation, application and prayer. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you uh, first got that revelation that we need to be self-feeders of the word. You know, it's interesting. Uh... I, I was in a church where the uh, the pastor, and I, I say this, and I shouldn't, but uh, I just wasn't getting fed. It was just like uh, the messages were were good, but they, they, they weren't giving me any new revelation. Mm. And I remember being so frustrated one day after about a year and a half of listening. I, I, went, I was in the restroom and I was crying out to God saying, I said, God, I'm going to starve in this place. And I know you asked me to come to this church, but I'm starving. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was almost as if the Holy Spirit said, I'll teach you. And I said, no, no, I'm starving here. And he said, I'll teach you. I'll teach you how to feed yourself. Why aren't you in the word? Why aren't you receiving revelation? Why are you waiting for someone to spoon feed you? Start to learn to feed yourself. Mm -hmm. And it started. And so I began journaling and uh, writing some things down. But it was sort of like a hit and miss sort of a way that I would do it. And then I just fell on, just write it all down, write the scripture. And then at that time in Bible college, I was learning about hermeneutics, which means learn the context. get Find out who is he talking to? Why is he saying what he's saying? And so make an observation that's unbiased. And so I would write that down. Now, how do you apply it to your life? You don't go from scripture to application. You go scripture to the hermeneutics of observation so that you know what God is saying. Then you apply it. So I thought, okay, now I'll apply it to my life. And then I would be praying, but I thought, I'm, I'm gonna write my prayer out. And so after a while doing this, I would do it with some friends. And one guy said, hey, you know, scripture, observation, that spells soap. And I said, yeah, it does. He said, let's soap together. <laughs> so that's how it started. Oh, it was just randomly. Someone uh, saw that and said, hey, that, that's what it spells. And ever since then, it was the soap method. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've had the uh, privilege of journaling with you in Starbucks in Hawaii and over here in Eugene, you know, different places over the years. And um, I love the fact that you don't just do it in your own personal devotional time, you do it with a group and then you share it with people what God yes. is saying yes. collectively because God doesn't speak to us individually, he speaks to us corporately as well. Um, tell us about the importance of uh, journaling and doing devotions with others. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. so good because what the Holy Spirit says to you when you share it, I think, ah, that's revelation to me mm. and vice versa. Mm. I tell people, you never dim the light of your candle by lighting that of another's. Mm. You, you know, sometimes we get it and go, oh, this is for me. Yeah, it could be. Share it, though, because it mm. could be for someone else. Well, it's for me. No, no. You never dim the light of God's revelation for you by giving it away mm. to free to somebody else. Mm. And so if you think about it, you can light a lot of people's candles, and your candle's still lit. Mm. But now you have a room full of light. So as we share it, everybody goes, wow, wow, and click, click, and lights turn on. Pretty soon we can light up the church mm. if we would be sharing with one another what God is saying to mm. us. Mm. Now, another thing you're well known for is uh, the the talk you did at the Willow Creek Leadership Summit, uh, the Global Leadership Summit, about how you went through a burnout mm -hmm. and uh, went through a time of restoration and you've written books about it, of course. 
So many pastors I bump into say that book saved them. And I know it saved me a number of times too. Uh, tell us a, a little bit of a snapshot of what you went through and the keys uh, that you like to pass on to people about not burning out. Yeah, you know, sometimes people burn out because they just take on too much, but other people burn out because they love so much. You love what you're doing. It gives you energy and you follow that energy and you follow that passion, but pretty soon you're depleted, but your love and compassion is so strong, you keep going. And that's what happened to me. I just loved ministry so much. I was depleted, but I still still kept going. And uh, but then I realized I'm human and I can't do that. And so when I fried my jets, I, uh, I was depleted of energy, depleted of what they call serotonins. And it took five years out of my life. I was depressed. I went in for depression counseling. I was filled with anxiety because my body, my mind just broke down. Mm. Then I realized that I'm human and I'm very fragile and frail and I need God's wisdom and help. So that book came out of a deep, dark time of not necessarily doing things wrong, it's just uh, loving what you do so much. Mm -hmm. I tell people, Matt, that uh, there's people in the church that will love you to death. They love you so much that you have to do my son's wedding. You have to come over and bless my house. You've got to be the one to, to give us you know, counsel, not, not so-and-so, you, Master. And if you're not careful, you'll give everything you got and more and you're left with nothing and people will love you to death. So you're the one that has to say, it's all right, I'm gonna you know, have so-and-so help. No, no, I need you, Pastor. I know that's so good, but I'm not the Messiah, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one and it ain't me. And pretty soon people begin to understand mm. that it's okay. Mm. It takes courage on your part, but we can do it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, um, my wife and I have been listening to a podcast recently, a guy named AJ Savoda, mm -hmm. who uh, I think came to college here, yes, uh -huh. and he's written a book about subversive Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It's really impacted us, and mm -hmm. my wife's been teaching on it a bit. She's been, you know, it's really impacted her. And, you know, we, it's really reminded us that when we have our Sabbath, we, it's a Monday for us. We try and put down our devices, these things, put them down, you know, go for a walk. Spend some time worshiping, you know, um, have a nice meal, go for a swim at the beach. What, you know, uh, you've got to learn to uh, switch off on your Sabbath and really spend the time with the Lord as well. Um, tell us what you've learned about Sabbath over the years. Yeah, you know, there's a rabbi that said it well. He said, one day God's going to hold us all accountable for all the things he created for us to enjoy, but we refuse to do so. And we can get so caught up in ministry that we miss the joys that God put mm. into the skies, the colors. He could have made it all grays mm. and drabs, but he made the northern lights and the aurora borealis and the beautiful hues of the sunrises and sunsets, mm. and we pass them by. Mm. I know that well because in Hawaii, after a while, you don't recognize the beautiful ocean mm. and the beaches mm. anymore. You take it for granted, mm. and it's gone. Mm. I remember when we pioneered in Honolulu, moved from the Big Island to Honolulu, and I was so busy, Matt, for four years now, though that island is surrounded by beautiful ocean, the only time I touched the ocean was when we baptized people. Four years, never went in the ocean to swim, to enjoy it, and that's when the Lord really spoke to me about Sabbathing. And it's not just going to church, it's Sabbathing, where you worship God, you give God the glory and enjoy the creation that reflects His personality. Mm -hmm. That's good. And I know you also like to keep fit. I remember in Hawaii doing that paddling on the, you know, I mean, look at you, you're ripped. You, you've been, yeah. you know, those guns have been working out. Um, I remember going for a run with all the other pastors at That's the practicum. Right. Oh, I loved it. Uh, it really has impacted us to Sabbath well, to be healthy. Uh, now, our time's almost up, and I know you've got to go to your Christmas service and preach, but you know, there's probably a lot of people in Australia that are going to watch this. Uh, people at New Hope Church Brisbane, uh, a lot of other pastors that know you, mm -hmm. uh, who love you in Australia. Do you want to just give out a, a message to everyone in Australia? Just oh, an yes. encouragement to everyone, yeah. To all of our dear brothers and sisters and our family in Australia, how we love you. And it's so good to be able to embrace the globe together. 
because our arms won't reach that far. But when we touch yours, we can both do it. And with the pastors in Japan and the others that we know in Myanmar and Philippines, we can embrace the world together. So what you're doing there down under is a part of what God's doing up here on the West Coast. Let's do it together and let's see what God can do. Well, Pastor Wayne, it's been so good to uh, catch up with you today. And um, I also wanted to personally thank you for uh, doing the foreword for my new book. Absolutely. History Makers uh, Devotions, Downloads and Dad Jokes. Um, I really appreciate <laughs> you doing that for us. And um, it, it really is your inspiration that inspired me to write that book because uh, I just really believe that, like you said before, it's the key to self-feed every day in God's Word. And uh, I really want to thank you for being such an inspirational leader and a role model to us. And uh, we're so blessed to catch up with you here in beautiful Eugene, Oregon. Thanks for your time. Oh, Matt, uh, you, you are such a dear friend and I love you much. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Let's stay connected together. Thanks so much. Well, I reckon you're a history maker. God bless. God bless you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.